Friends, I invite you at this time to open up your Bibles or your Bible apps to Hebrews chapter 12. And I've got some good news for you after covering an entire chapter last week. We're going to go a little easy on you this morning and just cover three verses. But don't get too excited. There's still a lot in these three verses. Our scripture reading for today comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we need you. I need you, Lord, to say the things that I need to say, and we all need you to hear the things that we need to hear. May your spirit be present and active in our midst so that you might, through our encounter with your word, lead us to a closer encounter with you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, when it comes to the topic of running, there's not a whole lot of middle ground. You either love it or you hate it. Sometimes you even may love it and hate it at the same time. As I was in my early days of trying to get back into the habit of running as an adult, I heard someone say this, and it stuck with me, but they said, I don't love the feeling of running, but I love the feeling of having run. And I think perhaps many of us can resonate with that. We can agree that maybe the best part of running is after it's over. Our often complicated feelings about running can come into play when we read passages like Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Some of us read these words and we feel all fired up. We are ready to go. We are ready to hit the ground running. Others of us hear these words and feel tired already and think this would be a great time to take a nap. But however we may feel about the author of Hebrews' choice to use the metaphor of running a race, God has given these words to us. He's given us these words to tell us something that we need to hear. The life of faith can be grueling and it can be arduous, yet we are not alone. God has given us encouragement along the way, and ultimately, in Jesus Christ, God has given us himself. And because of this, we can run the race of life with confidence. We will encounter his grace to keep us going and to uphold us every single step of the way. And so as we consider these three opening verses of Hebrews 12 this morning, Scripture reminds us of the race of the life of faith and of its rigors. Scripture reminds us of the encouragement that we can receive from those who have gone on before us, those who have already finished the race. Scripture reminds us of our call to run the race that God has marked out for us to the best of our ability. And finally, Scripture shows us Jesus who is the source of our endurance and of our strength. As we open up our passage today, the first thing that we see is a description of the race and its rigors. Like the Apostle Paul, the author of Hebrews uses this metaphor of a race to communicate truth about the Christian life. Now, based on how frequently we see this metaphor of running used throughout the New Testament, we can get a pretty good idea that the first century believers must have been pretty familiar with all sorts of races and athletic competitions of the ancient world. Many of them perhaps had watched in person as they had seen runners compete with one another in the arena in order to win the victor's crown. 
And so drawing upon this familiar reference point from their culture, the author of Hebrews addresses his audience in much the same way that many preachers today would use a football or a baseball analogy to teach us truth about God. And this is what he tells us in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now in writing these words, the author of Hebrews puts the rich theological framework of the preceding chapters into action. So far in the letter to the Hebrews, he has meticulously presented the case for the superiority of Christ over all the trappings of any competing religious claim or practice. He has examined every article of Old Testament belief and ceremony that anyone might possibly use to try to entice believers to go back into their familiar ways of the Jewish faith. And the author all along has been turning these arguments around, showing how in reality they point toward the greater person and work of Jesus. Now, as he completes the 11th chapter, the author of Hebrews has just driven home his coup de grace. He has gathered up all of the greatest heroes of the Jewish Hall of Fame, and he has shown that the driving force of their lives was not allegiance to the Old Testament ritual, but rather that all of that ritual was showing that their allegiance was really to the one that the ritual was pointing to all along, the sign of something and someone greater who was to come. In other words, the author has taken the very people that the Judaizers would have claimed were on their team, and he has shown how all along these people were on Jesus' team. So now, After raising up this monumental construction of theological truth, what does the author of Hebrews do with it? He talks about how we are to live in response. Theology, as we see through Scripture, finds its truest expression, its natural and logical conclusion, when we live out a passionate and sincere relationship of intimacy with and obedience to Jesus Christ. All along, the point of our doctrine is to point us to Jesus so that we might live out these truths by walking with him. And so what are the readers of this letter to do with all the things that they have learned? They are to run the race of the life of faith to which Jesus has called all of us. The author of Hebrews writes to us with a sense of earnest, urgent conviction. He says the life of faith is not easy It is a contest which requires the very best that we can give. It is lived out not as a casual casual stroll or as a a half-hearted jog, but instead as a race, as a marathon, which demands the very best of us. It demands focus, exertion, sacrifice, and perseverance. We put our theology into practice by straining onward to win the prize. Running with this metaphor, the 16th century reformer John Calvin noted, we are engaged in a contest, even in a race, the most celebrated, that many witnesses stand around us, that the Son of God is the umpire who invites and exhorts us to secure the prize, and that therefore it would be most disgraceful for us to grow weary or inactive in the midst of our course. Calvin acknowledges the demands of this race, that it would be easy for us to grow weary along the way. And so he suggests to us that we must be on our guard against giving up or against growing inactive as the race wears on. Pastor Richard Phillips reminds us that this is a long race. If we are not careful about the pace that we set, we will grow winded and we will want to give up. Phillips warns us, notice what kind of race we run. It is not a short sprint, and we will not finish it with a reckless burst of energy. Rather, he says, it is a long-distance race, and our great virtue is not speed, but perseverance. One of the big differences between an experienced runner and an inexperienced runner 
is that the inexperienced runner will be tempted to set a faster pace at the beginning than is wise. And, and perhaps you've done that. I know that I have done that. It feels good when the race begins and you start off going as fast as you can and you s- pass by the other runners and you see them behind you and you're in the front of the pack. But what happens when we do that? Well, we wear ourselves out. We can't continue that pace for long. And before too long, all of those runners that we passed earlier start to pass us one by one by one. And at that point, it becomes very difficult just to finish the race as the body grows tired, let alone to try to win that race. And so that's why Phillips reminds us that the Christian life is not a dazzling display of speed and prowess, but rather it is a matter of keeping a steady pace over the long term. We may see other runners grow weary and fall behind, but if we keep that steady pace, we will continue progressing toward our goal. Acknowledging the real danger of wearing out along the way, the author of Hebrews goes on to say in verse 3, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, now we'll come back to this verse and take another closer look later on when we consider more fully how we prevent race fatigue. But for now, it's important for us to see that the author of Hebrews presents race fatigue as a very real danger. For if we are not mindful of how we run, we can become vulnerable to weariness. In the original Greek, the author's wording suggests here not just a physical weariness, but a deeper weariness, a weariness of the soul. And so in this deep-seated soul weariness, more than just physical exhaustion, we can find that it becomes easy to lose heart. Richard Phillips goes on to say to us, from time to time, Christians grow weary and become downcast. If you feel this way, you are not exceptional. This is something you should expect, especially when faced with prolonged difficulty or trials. Even the strongest Christian can experience spiritual depression. This is a normal part of the Christian life. If you start feeling like you're getting tired in the race, it's not because you're not a good runner. It's because the race is hard. It's because we are called to run for a long time. And sometimes the paths and the trails that God calls us to take bring obstacles that we felt we never would have expected or prepared for. Many of us know believers who have started off running well, but because of the challenges of the race have become discouraged or depressed. And many of us, if we are honest, have found ourselves in that situation as well. When our goals may seem out of reach, we may wonder if this race has been a waste of time. We may feel like giving up or just walking for the rest of the course. And so we need the encouragement that this passage brings to us because, friends, the race is real and the race is rigorous. It demands every ounce of strength and determination that we have. So how do we run it well? How can we keep from giving up? How can we avoid runner's fatigue or overcome it when it comes upon us? The author of Hebrews mentions several different factors that can help us to move forward in this race. The next thing that he tells us that we see in our passage is that we can find meaningful encouragement from those who have finished the race ahead of us. We must run the race. No one else can run it for us, but we do not run it alone. Looking back at the first half of verse 1, the author tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So, So what's the motivation here? What's the rationale for how we are to run? It is this cloud of witnesses that is around us. This includes the heroes of the faith mentioned in chapter 11, people like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and many, many more. But it also includes others, those who are not mentioned in Scripture, but who have still gone before us. 
The cloud of witnesses includes famous Christians from history, like the martyrs, the church fathers, and the church mothers, the reformers, and the pioneers of global missions. It includes heroes that we hear about in sermons and that we read about in history and in biographies. But this cloud of witness also includes those that we have known over the course of our lives, those who have invested in us and in our faith personally, people like parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles, mentors, teachers, pastors, small group leaders, prayer partners and prayer warriors, and so many others who have left their distinct thumbprint upon our spiritual life an imprint that sticks with us and leaves its mark upon us even long after we have parted ways or after their race has come to an end. But this cloud of witnesses also includes countless others, names that we may never know and faces that we may never see on this side of heaven, but who nevertheless have had an influence on the race that we run and who are watching eagerly to see us run well and cross the finish line. There are a few things that are helpful for us to know about this cloud of witnesses. First, the author of Hebrews speaks of them not as a wax museum of frozen figures, but rather as a vibrant, living multitude of active watchers. Though the saints who have gone before us are dead in this life, they still live on. These living witnesses are not merely silent spectators. We don't want to think of them as we might think of a crowd watching the Masters or a golf tournament where the golfer sinks the putt and their response is, while that may be appropriate for the putting green, that's not what the author of Hebrews has in mind. Instead, what he's thinking of, to put it in our world, is perhaps a little bit more like the fans who drive halfway across the state to cheer on their local hometown Indiana high school basketball team. You know what this is like. The whole town is empty back home because everyone is there at the game. They're there to support their team people who are the players that are their kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, the kid that delivers the paper, the fellow church members, people that they have known since they were this tall, and now they are cheering them on because they're part of the same team. They're part of the same community. They belong to one another, and when you are watching them play, they are your team, and in your heart, you are out there on the court with them. And when you see one of these hometown players make a shot, the crowd goes wild. The whole town celebrates. Richard Phillips describes the effect that this can have on us as we are running our race. Phillips says, he, the author of Hebrews, tells us that the stands are packed with the saints of old. He places them there not merely as spectators, but as a cheering section. He tells us to pay attention to their testimony to heed the encouragement they give us. He says their presence gives us the home field advantage for our race. If only we will see them there by faith and hear their cries. Amazing to think that we can have the home field advantage because of this cloud of witnesses cheering us on. But there's more going on here than just a cheering section. This cloud of witnesses is there not only to inspire us by their cheers, but also by their example. Michael Kruger points out there is something very different about this crowd. They are not there to watch you, or we would say simply to watch you. They are there to be seen by you as you run. This encourages you about what is possible. There will be times when you think you cannot finish, you cannot push past the pain, but then you realize the stadium is filled with people who have finished the race. It can be be done. When we think about who is in that crowd and when we consider the races that they have run, when when we ponder the records broken, the hurdles cleared, the injuries endured, and the finish lines crossed, thinking of those who are watching us and cheering for us can prompt us in our race to push a little harder, to dig a little deeper, to run a little longer, to pick up the pace, to take a deep breath, and to keep on putting one 
foot in front of the other. Some of you, especially those of you who have seen me up close this morning or who are sitting a little closer, have perhaps noticed the tie that I'm wearing today. We, we've got a picture up there for you to see. It could still be a little hard to tell exactly what's going on, so let me tell you, this is a tie that shows a marathon of runners running a race. Now, I have to tell you, it's not every week that a preacher happens to have a tie that matches the sermon. <laughs> so naturally, it made my choice of what to wear easy today. It's also a fitting choice because, as some of you know or have guessed, this is a Lane Anderson tie. And so I, I wear it thinking of him because it reminds me of one of our many Presby saints that have finished the race and who are now part of our own WEPC cheering section in heaven. I also wear it because it reminds me of how I consider Lane, who was a marathon runner himself, part of my own cloud of witnesses as I run the race of life. During the 10 years that Lane and I knew each other upon this earth, Lane encouraged me both literally and metaphorically to run the race well. When I committed myself to the discipline of regular morning runs seven years ago, a, a discipline which, to be honest, I've been a little lacking in lately, and so I'm thinking of Lane, and he's saying, pick up the pace, buddy. But on those mornings, I would often cross paths with Lane and Jill as they, too, were on a morning walk or jog. After all, we all know Warsaw isn't that big, so if there are people who are all outdoors exercising at the same time, sooner or later they're going to run into each other. And run into each other we did. Whenever I would see Lane on those mornings, he would cheer me on. And when I knew that he was in sight, it made me pick up the pace and run a little <laughs> bit faster, even if I was tired. And on Sunday mornings, Lane would continue to cheer me on, encouraging me to keep running. If it had been a while since he had seen me out on the streets on a morning, Lane would ask me if I was still running. And even though the answer was typically yes, I knew that from Lane this was more of a statement than it was a question. Knowing that Lane was there, knowing that he knew firsthand the joys and the challenges of the course, and that he kept note of my pace, and that he wanted to see me succeed, all of this gave me encouragement and accountability that made me a better runner in more ways than one. And Lane is just one of many. The rest of you, and I know many others of you have often seen me on the road on those mornings and cheered me on, you know who you are, and so do I. And I know everyone's going to ask me about that in the weeks ahead. Good, that's what we're here for, to cheer one another on. In God's generous providence, he has given us a great cloud of witnesses to spur us on. But in the spirit of Hebrews, in addition to this cloud, there is an even greater witness to draw us forward in the race, and that witness is Jesus himself. Continuing on to the rest of verse 1 and verse 2, the author of Hebrews urges us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus appears in this passage not just as the pioneer and perfecter of our individual faith, but as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith in general. He is the one who has gone before us. He is the original champion of the race. His race is over. He is sitting down now at the Father's right hand. But the author of Hebrews describes Jesus in such a way as to draw our attention to the race that Jesus ran. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, our English translations render the Greek vocabulary here with a nuance that fits the uniqueness of his race. And while that is appropriate, it can, to some extent, mask the fact that the same vocabulary is used in these verses to describe how we are to run and how Jesus ran. The same word is, to, is used to describe the race that is marked out or set before us and the joy that was set before or marked out for Jesus. There's a parallel going on there. 
And in the same way, when the author urges us in verse 1 to run with perseverance or endurance, it is the same word used in verse 2 to describe how Jesus endured or persevered the cross. And this parallel wording is no coincidence. The author wants us to know that when we run our race, we are reflecting the Savior who has run his race. Just as Jesus endured, he calls us and equips us to endure. Just as his race involved adversity and sacrifice, ours will too. But what is the essence of the race? What is at the heart of the race marked out for Jesus? Well, the passage tells us joy. It was for the joy that was marked out for him that he endured. And if we continue the parallel there, that suggests that the race that God has marked out for us is also one where we can experience joy. Even when we face trials and setbacks, when the road is hard, when we experience obstacles and pulled muscles and strained, sprained ankles, that need not rob us of the joy that awaits as we press on toward the finish line where Jesus is waiting with open arms. This passage reminds us that we do not run alone. We have one another. We have those who have gone before us, and we have Jesus himself to encourage us, to inspire us, and to keep us going. And keep going we must, because each of us must follow our call to run the race that is before us. Now, how does this cloud of witnesses inform our lives? Going back to verse 1, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This brings us back to the meat of our passage. The author packs a lot of ideas together, but if we could boil it all down to one thing, to one central thought, what is it he's telling us to do? Well, does anyone here remember diagramming sentences in school? You know, the, the idea is to show how every word in a sentence is related to the main thought. Some of you thought this was fun. Most of you thought it was torture. Uh, but even in a complex, convoluted sentence, you could boil it down to a subject and a verb, to a complete thought. Now, to be honest, even the most convoluted sentences from my high school English class pale in comparison to some of the whoppers that we find in the Greek New Testament. So don't worry, we won't take the time this morning to diagram all of verse 1. But if we did, we would find that the grammatical core of the verse is one word, really a phrase, the verb construction trechomen, which means let us run. That is the heart of our verse this morning, let us run. How do we respond to the rich theology of Hebrews? Let us run. What do we do when we're confronted with the breathtaking reality that Jesus is greater than everything else? Let us run. How do we react to the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 and the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us? Let us run. What do we do in spite of the obstacles and the struggles that we face in this life? Let us run. But how are we to run? The author of Hebrews offers us some words of instruction. First, we are called to strip away the things that would slow us down. Runners who want to go far do not carry unnecessary burdens. They avoid entanglements. They strip away extra layers. They cast off encumberments. They stay on the true course and avoid getting bogged down in the mud, the weeds, or the bushes. And so for us in our race of faith, this means letting go of what we do not need. It means resisting sin and temptation, yes, but it also extends to other things that may not be wrong to do, but that would still distract us or impede us from our true goal of winning the race. It means saying no to whatever does not help us to run faster or to run farther. Michael Kruger reminds us that this requires a lot of intentionality on our part. He says, you do not have to work very hard to be entangled by sin. In fact, that is the default in life. If you do nothing to fight it, sin will cling to you tightly. 
So if you are going to run the race, you have to be proactively casting off sin. In a similar spirit, Simon Kistemacher adds, every believer must run the race that God has set out for him. And everyone has his own set of obstacles, his own track, and his own capabilities. To run the race God has given us, we must put aside everything that hinders us. On the track of faith, we are told to travel far. Therefore, we must travel light. In addition to the call to strip away impediments, the author of Hebrews also notes our call to pay attention to the path that God has marked out for us. And when we recognize that path, to give everything we've got to run forward on that path. As Christians, we all run the same race, but we do not all run in the same way, or at the same pace, or even on exactly the same path. God has appointed each of us a specific course to run that is tailored to the unique gifts he has given us and the unique work that he has called us to do as we proclaim and pursue the kingdom of God. So one of the reasons that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus is so that we can see where he is leading us and press on toward that calling. We're reminded that the best way to run our race is not by trying to figure out everything or get all the answers ahead of time, but rather to see where Jesus is leading us and to follow his lead, to trust him, and to run where he tells us to go. It's one thing for us to talk about these truths, and it's another thing for us to actually live them out. And so as a way of illustrating this task of following Jesus' lead as he shows us where and how we are to run, there's something that I must now tell all of you. And that is that as I have been running my race of faith and of service to the Lord, he has been whispering in my ear for nearly six months that there is a fork that is coming up in the road. After months and months of soul searching, of protesting, of arguing and wrestling with God, of praying, submitting, grieving, and then wrestling more and praying and submitting and grieving all over again. I've come to recognize and to know and to obey the fact that Jesus has told me that my time here at WEPC will soon come to an end. So, dear friends, it is with sadness and joy, but in this moment mostly sadness, that I announce to you that at the end of this calendar year, I will be leaving Warsaw, Evangelical Presbyterian Church in order to accept a call to serve as the pastor of another EPC congregation. It has been an honor and it has been a joy to run this race with you for the last 10 years. And believe me, I would gladly run with you for 10 years or 20 years longer. As we have run together, we have rejoiced together. We have wept together. We have been in the trenches together, and we have bled together. You are my family. You are my home. You are an important part of my cloud of witnesses. My heart belongs to you. But even more than that, my heart belongs to Jesus. And to a point that I cannot ignore and must not ignore, I've heard the voice of Jesus asking me, patiently, but clearly. Andrew, are you willing to go where I ask you to go? Are you willing to give up everything that you have here for my sake and for the sake of my people in another place? And so I've given Jesus my answer. Yes, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to go where you send me. I'm willing to trust you with the people that I love and that I care about. I'm willing to place them in your hands and I'm willing to place my future in your hands. And to the search team and to the elders of First Presbyterian Church of Ossian, Indiana, I have also given my answer, which is, yes, I will come. 
I will run this race with you. I will open my heart to you, proclaim God's word to you, and pursue Jesus with you. And now to all of you, dear friends, I say thank you. Thank you for running with me. Thank you for how you have shown me how to run well. Thank you for your example of faith and of faithfulness. Thank you for all of the things that you have taught me. Thank you for the ways that you have inspired me, encouraged me, loved me, and supported me. Thank you for running this race by my side. We have a few more months together, and we will run together in those months before we will part ways. So let's make the most of that time that we have. Let's run this next portion of the race well so that when our paths diverge, we will continue running forward as Christ leads us. Let us run well. Let us spur one another on toward faithfulness. And in all things, let us keep our eyes on Jesus. Wow. So where, where do we go from here? Well, the text, friends, points us to Jesus. In light of all things, what keeps us going? In the midst of a marathon race that is filled with ups and downs, filled with surprises and setbacks, filled with joys and with sorrows, filled with triumphs and with trials, how do we endure What does it take for us to keep putting one foot in front of the other even when we don't know if we can go on or whether we really want to? The author of Hebrews places Jesus at the center of this passage to show us that Christ alone is the source of our strength. Christ alone is the source of our hope. Christ alone is the one who marks out our race. And Christ alone is the one who helps us to stand and to endure? Where do we find the strength to carry on? By setting our eyes on the one who endured his race. Let's take another look at verses 2 and 3. How does it say we are to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us? It is by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In order to endure the rigors of the race and to run victoriously across the finish line, we must fix our eyes on Jesus, as we see in verse 2. And we must consider Jesus, as we see in verse 3. Both of these are important ways to talk about how we run for Christ. When running, and you know this, where we look determines where we end up. If I am out on the streets of Warsaw and I'm fixing my eyes on anything other than the goal ahead of me, I'm going to have trouble going in the right direction. If I look to the side, I'm going to end up running into a tree or in the road. If I look up at the sky, I'm going to trip and fall. If I look down at my feet, I'm going to run into a street sign or something else ahead of me. But as I look ahead, there I'm able to press on toward the destination. If we look ahead in our own lives to where Jesus is, to where Jesus is calling us, then every stride that we take will bring us closer to him. Second, we must consider Jesus. Consider who he is and how he has run ahead of us. As most runners have discovered, the hardest part of running is often not the physical exertion, but the mental game. Races are won or lost in the mind. What we think about and how we think about our race determines how we will run. If I'm running and if I allow myself to start thinking about how tired I feel or how far I still have to go before I can stop, then I'm not going to run very well. I psych myself out and I end up more tired and I may not be able to accomplish the distance I want to. But... As I have learned, running is an opportunity for us to intentionally focus on what matters most. And so for me, I pray. 
As I set aside a part of each route, I pray for every member of my family. As I pass by different locations in our community, I say prayers appropriate to what will be happening at those locations throughout the day or the week. When I pass by your homes and workplaces, as I do for many of you, I offer a silent prayer on your behalf. And as the Lord draws people and needs to my mind, I pray for them. The effect of this prayer on my running is that it keeps my head and my focus in the right place. When my mind is focused on the kingdom, I don't think so much about how tired I am. When each step is accompanied by a sense of God's presence and purpose, it's a lot easier to take the next one. In the same way, as we make Jesus our primary focus, it changes how we run the race of our lives. Our hardships are placed in their true perspectives. As we focus on Jesus' trials and on what he has overcome, we discover that maybe what we thought was an obstacle isn't such a big obstacle after all. Perhaps we find that something we considered an obstacle or a burden is actually something that he put in our race to make us a better runner and help us to run more like him. We find that our goals and our values are recalibrated to line up with who Jesus is. We become less vulnerable to temptation and distraction if our minds are dialed in to the mind of Christ. The way that we measure our success and our failure will come to have more to do with his kingdom than it will with ours. And our sense of what we need to make it through to the end will be transformed as we discover that Jesus is all that we truly need. John Owen, who was a 17th century English Puritan, whose writings still inspire many believers today, wrote these words of encouragement as he reflected on this passage. He said, A constant view of the glory of Christ will revive our souls and cause our spiritual lives to flourish and to thrive. He says, the more we behold the glory of God by faith now, the more spiritual and the more heavenly will be the state of our souls. The reason why the spiritual life in our souls decays and withers is because we fill our minds full of other things. And he goes on to say, but when the mind is filled with thoughts of Christ and his glory, these things will be expelled. This is how our spiritual life is revived. In the same spirit, John Calvin reminds us, Christ also is not only the umpire, but extends his hand to us and supplies us with strength and energy. In short, he prepares and fits us to enter on our course and by his power leads us on to the end of the race. Friends, Jesus has called us to this race. Jesus has run it before us, and he has triumphed. Jesus is with us now to equip us and to encourage us along the way. Jesus is waiting for us with open arms at the finish line. And when we get there, Jesus will hand us the victor's crown. So friends, let us press on to run this race with perseverance, and let us in all things fix our eyes upon him. One of the ways that we do this, one of the ways that we fix our eyes upon Jesus and that we consider what he has endured is through the rhythm of coming back to the Lord's table each month. As scripture tells us, it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He gladly went through this race to bring us back to him. As we come to this table again this morning, we are reminded of how he suffered and died in our place. We are reminded of how, as he finished this race and crossed the finish line and sat down at the Father's hand, that he invites us to share in his victory. And so this is the Lord's table, and he invites us to come and to receive, to eat and to drink, to be spiritually filled and nourished and reminded of who he is and what he has come to do. This is not a table for one church or denomination. This is the Lord's table for all who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If he is your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to receive from this table again today. But if you're not able this morning to say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, 
or if you've been walking out of step with him, then we invite you, friends, to use this time to pray and to reflect, to ponder who Jesus is, to ask him to speak to you and to minister to your soul, to bring you to the point where you say, yes, Lord, I will follow. You will be my Lord and you will be my Savior. And our prayer is that when we do this again next month, you'll be at the place where you're ready to partake with us. But friends, don't get the wrong idea. This is not a table for those who have all the answers, for those whose lives are all tidy and put together. This is a table for those who are hungry, for those who are poor, for those who know that our help is found in Jesus Christ alone. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds, I ask that you would join me in prayer and following the prayer in a song of preparation. Heavenly Father, we come to this table again. And as we ponder the mystery of your love for us and of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us, we come with hearts in need of you. Lord, we are here this morning and our minds are swirling with thoughts. Our hearts are swirling with feelings. Lord, we need you. You are our shield. You are our defender. You are our portion. It is in you that we have life and hope and peace. It is by your grace that we are able to run uh, this race. And so, Lord, we ask that as we receive this bread and this cup, that they will become for us a means of grace. Bless them, Lord, and strengthen us through them. Prepare our hearts. Give us a hunger for you that nothing else, Lord, would satisfy except you alone. We pray these things in Christ's name. Let us sing together. Give us clean hands. Give us pure.